but it'll be a great study, one of the most uh, foundational to our faith books in the Bible. And today, we're going to look at where Wilmer just read for us, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. If you haven't already, please open up there. We'll spend all of our time uh, studying this passage. And to begin to do that this morning, I want to start my time with you by talking about something that I'm sure is all primary in our mind here in the middle of June, which is gift giving, right? We're about six months away from Christmas. I'm sure gift giving maybe is already on your mind. It's timed, at the, especially at the mall, to start thinking about filling out that uh, Christmas list and getting all those gifts for the Christmas season. And specifically, I want to start by thinking about gift giving for that person or maybe it's persons who have everything. For the people in our lives that have it all, we've experienced what I'm about to talk about this morning. The struggle of trying to find that gift, trying to find that perfect gift for the person who just seems to have everything they ever want, right? The person who has everything. It's a story and it's a challenge that we hear about at Christmas time especially. What to get the person who has everything. Everything And so as I often do, as I was preparing this message, I googled that question. What to get the person that has everything? And the first article that came up was from self.com, and it had a list from this January, January 2020, 2023, of 65 thoughtful gifts for the person, for the people who have everything. I will not read all 65 of self.com's um, uh, suggestions, just the top three. And number three in the list was this acupressure mat. Not acupuncture, that would be very different, but acupressure, which you can lay on at the end of the day and allow these needles, these uh, little pressure points all along the back of your, uh, all along your back to sort of release the tension of your day. That's the number three gift that they suggest to get the person who has everything. Number two was this bindle water bottle. Everybody is carrying around a water bottle nowadays, but this takes it a step further. This you can not only carry your water bottle with, but it has this little storage, storage compartment at the bottom, and you can hold your keys, you can hold money, you can hold your credit cards, even a small snack inside, so you can take care of both of your basic needs with this Bindle water bottle and its storage compartment. And number one on the list it was this alarm clock. Now this is not just your, sorry for the way the picture is kind of blurry, but this is no ordinary alarm clock. This clock, I want to read the description. The night owl is, is for the night owl who is trying to become an earlier riser. And this is a self-certified gentle sunrise simulation clock that combines light therapy, an alarm clock, it's a white noise machine, and it's a reading light all in one. This programmable clock becomes gradually brighter as it approaches the time for you to wake up, and in the evening it becomes dimmer as it becomes time for you to go to bed. So an all-in-one, it, it does so many things in this alarm clock. Um, so that's the number one gift that they recommend for the person that has everything. And one more gift. Finally, I, I did a search on Amazon, gifts for the person that has everything. And, and this, if you come to the end of your rope and you can't find anything to give the person who has everything, you could just get them this T-shirt, which says, I already have everything, so they got me this shirt. What to get the person that has everything? Why am I thinking about this question this morning? Well, because I think that it is the question that the Apostle Paul asks for us as the people, as Christians, as believers, as the people who have everything. Think about for a moment what Jeff did a wonderful job of leading us through last week, what Ephesians chapter 1 verses 1 through 15 or 1 through 14 remind us of. Reflect with me on a moment and reflect on some of the glorious realities that are ours as described in Ephesians chapter 3 verses four, uh, 3 through 14 in Christ. First, we were chosen, each and every one of us, by God before the very foundation and creation of the world. We were chosen by God to be holy and blameless in his sight, even though we would be sinners as each and every one of us are. In God's rich love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship or daughtership through his perfect son, through the sacrifice of of his perfect son. In that way, God has adopted us in a, freely way, in a free way out of his love. He's paid the price for us to be 
adopted. And that was through Christ, through God's Son, through the Son of God's blood, we have redemption and forgiveness of our sins. Now we can, and, and if we are in Christ, we are experiencing the richness of grace and forgiveness of sins that God has not just given, but he has lavished. He has just covered us in. And with this, God has given us all wisdom and understanding according to his good pleasure and his perfect timing. We are a part of God's plan of salvation, and we are a part of it, God's plan of salvation in two ways. First, we get to personally and intimately experience God's plan of salvation in that we are saved from the destruction that our sin should have brought upon us. And then the second way is we get to tell the world how they can be saved from the, from the path of sin that their sin has led them down. We get to have the Holy Spirit of God, God's very presence, God himself dwelling within our lives. We get this guaranteed inheritance in the Holy Spirit and the experience in this life, the fullness of God's redemption come to us. We get all these wonderful blessings from God through Christ. To summarize this, Paul in verse number three says, we as Christians, we as the church, we as believers, we are blessed in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Let me say that again because this is the foundation of the book of Ephesians. We as Christians are blessed in all the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So I begin our time this morning in our study of Ephesians by asking, church, do we realize who we are? Do we realize what we have? Do we realize who we've been crafted to be? We are, through Christ, blessed in all the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing known to mankind and even those that are unknown to mankind, right? We are the people who have it all. We are the people who have everything at our disposal. We, as a, we are the church, the church, the capital C church. We have it all. We have everything to be who we are called and crafted to be. Who Christ has created us and now enabled us through his sacrifice on the cross to be again. I thank Pastor Jeff for starting off our summer ser sermon series in the book of Ephesians last week so well. I just want to quickly introduce the way that I feel the Lord is leading me to preach the rest of this series. I've entitled the series Ephesians, Becoming Who You Are. The book of Ephesians, this letter to the church in Ephesus written by Paul some uh, 2,000 years ago, it addresses in beautiful detail the some of the most basic yet some of the most essential and beautiful realities. And it answers some of the most important questions that each and every one of us will face in our lives. The question of who, who are we? The question of who am I? The question of what is my identity? Those questions and so much more are answered by the book of Ephesians. As I thought about this series, I I was reminded of this game show. If you, it was a kind of a random, short-lived game show back in the mid 2000s. What it was called, Identity. It was hosted by Ten, Penn Teller, and the premise of the show was, with very little information, it, uh, contestants were to guess individuals' identity. And what I remember about the show is Penn Teller would always ask at the moment of the revelation of the identity, he would point and he would always do this with his fingers. I remember, and he would say, "Is that your identity?" And that's the question that each and every one of us faces in our lives. It's the problem that creates sin in our lives. It's misplaced identity. That leads us to all the follies of sin that our world and our lives foray into. The problem is sin creates and blurs our minds. It distracts us from who we are. The problem of our lives and the problem that, that leads us into sin is that we don't know who we are because we don't know whose we are. But make no mistake, it is not because of a lack of information that we don't know who we are or whose we are. We have the gourmet of, of all of God's word and, and we have this wonderful book of Ephesians that shows us in great length and great beauty who and whose we are. And so it is, again, so wonderfully summed up in verse number three of chapter one. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are his. We are, we, are, are, we are Jesus Christ. And who we are, we have been blessed 
in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. We are those that have been given through Christ every spiritual blessing. This is who we are, regardless of whether or not we are a follower of Christ in this moment or not. We are ones who, through the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, have at our disposal, have been given, have been blessed in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. It is sitting on our doorfront right now, whether we are in Christ in this moment or not. Let me repeat that. No matter who you are, whether you sit here, you join us online this morning as a Christian or not, regardless of your sin or previous hatred towards God prior to this moment, You are one who is blessed in this moment, sitting at your feet, waiting for you, every spiritual blessing in and through Christ. That's who you are out of the richness of the love of God that that God has lavished on you. The separation point between being a Christian and living out this spiritual blessing is, is whether you are living as who you are. Whether or not you are living as a person who has been given everything in Christ, every blessing in Christ. And of course, we know how you begin that relationship. You confess with your words what Paul reminds us of in our passage of study today. That you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. That you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And that because of this, Jesus Christ in this moment is seated at the right hand of God in victory. And thus, in this moment, every ruler, every authority, every power, every dominion, every name, including your name and my name, is under him. And is also filled by him in every way. Separation point between living in this spiritual blessing, being who we have called to be, is is whether or not we are surrendered to Christ and who he has crafted and created us to be or not. The reality that the Bible reminds us of is is the question is not whether or not we are actually Christ or not or, or whose we actually are. That is a reality that's set in stone. We have no voice in it. One day, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is seated on the throne right now. The question that we get to answer in this life is, are we surrendered to that in this life right now? Will we give voice to that in our own lives through both our words and our actions now? And so I say all that to say and to introduce our passage and our series to remind us That what we read in the book of Ephesians is who we are. Yes, we are sinners. Yes, we have fallen well short of the glory of God. But God does not first identify us as sinners. But rather, he identifies us through our Savior. His Son, Jesus Christ, who has brought us salvation. Who has brought us every spiritual blessing. Every spiritual blessing in all the heavenly realms. That is who we are. We are. That is what we have, the gift we have been given and placed at our feet. The question is, do we know and are we surrendered to whose and who we are? And so Jeff unpacked last week what we all praise God for, which is the identity and the restoring of our identity through the redemption of Christ, the spiritual blessing that is ours in Christ. And now we come to verse 15 where the Apostle Paul gives us his and and what should be our response to these spiritual blessings in Christ, which simply is is prayer and praise. Prayer for more of God and what God has given to us, the blessings that he has freely bestowed upon our lives. Paul exemplifies for us here in Ephesians 1, 15 through 23 that the proper response to the blessings of God and the realization of our identity that Christ gives us before God is, is to pray. Specifically, to pray for more of him, to pray for more of God, to pray and seek more of God's blessings in our lives, to pray for more knowledge of God and his rich love, to pray for more faith. That's what these eight verses that Wilmer just read for us are. Paul's prayer that God's people seek in prayer more of God and his power. So today I want to use the rest of my time with you to answer a basic, maybe a a seemingly basic and and fundamental, certainly fundamental to our faith, reality of living as children of God. But I want to answer it through two questions. First, how do I pray? I want to first answer that question. And then I want to answer the question of what should we pray for? Let's look at this passage and we'll see that those are the questions that Paul answers for us. First, how do I pray? Read with me again verse number 15. Paul says, for this reason, for all the reasons that Jeff led us through and that we just talked about, for this reason, all the blessings that Christ has given to us, 
ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for all God's people. And I want to pause there mid-sentence and remind ourselves that proper prayer is centered on the right things. And the right things can be summed up in two ways. First, proper prayer is centered on faith. And proper prayer is, is centered on a love for God's people. What Paul is doing here is commending the people of the church of Ephesus for their faith. For the way that it is evident through their lives that they are children of the living and the true God. Now, we are not given specifics of how the Ephesian church is faithfully living out their faith, but we really don't need specifics. We know what this looks like. God's word declares this very clearly throughout its pages. We know that through God's word that a faithful life, a faithful church that is, loves God and is loved with God's people cares for God and it cares for God's people. It lives out the greatest commandment that Jesus gives to us. It loves God and out of its love for God, it loves and cares for people. The church of Ephesus was clearly caring for the orphan and the widow. They were feeding the hungry. They were caring for the sick. They were proclaiming and living for God against stern opposition to God and his word that we know that the church of Ephesus, Ephesus faced. For examples of this, you can read through Acts chapter 19 and see the opposition that the church of Ephesus lived through and faithfully proclaimed God through. We also see in Acts chapter 19 that along with their care for people's basic needs, the church in Ephesus was caring for their community's greatest need. What is that greatest need? Well, it's the same greatest need that our community still needs to this day. They were sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, it is really not that complicated when you think about it. If we want to be women and men after God's own heart, if we want to be a church commended for our faith and lives and thus our prayers, we have to be centered. Our lives and our prayers have to be centered on the right things. First, faith. Faith that our faith would grow. That our church, that the individuals that make up our church, that our faith would grow. And that through our faith and the, the expansion of our faith, that our love for all of God's people would grow. You ask the question, how do I pray? Well, start right here. Start by asking God that your faith, that the faith of your church, that the faith of the individual members of our church and your personal faith, that it would grow. Whether that is through beginning a relationship with Jesus Christ, whether that's through rededicating your life to Jesus Christ, or whether that's just through more deeply and more intimately growing to a living and vibrant faith in Christ Jesus. And as that happens, as our love for God, God grows, as our faith in God grows, our love for God's people cannot help but grow. If you say or you think that you are growing in your faith and your love for God, but your love for God's people, for all the people created in God's image, which is each and every one of us and every eye that we will look into on the street, if your love for the loss of this world, for the church, is not growing, then you may not be growing in your faith in God. I would say, in fact, you're certainly not growing in faith in God, but growing in something else. Because these two things, our faith growing and our love for God's people growing, they cannot, they are never separated. You cannot grow in your faith. You cannot be a prayer warrior after God's own heart if your love and your prayers for all of God's people are not growing. So how do I pray? Proper prayer is centered on the right things. First, faith. And second, a love for God's people. Then verse number 16, proper prayer and a growing faith in our identity also counts and recounts its blessings. Paul continues his prayer and praise for the Ephesian church with this. He says, I have not stopped giving thanks for you while remembering you in my prayers. Prayer, although we often make it to be, prayer is, is not that complicated. I've actually experienced this personally in my own prayer life recently. One of the best ways to move ourselves from the doldrums of life, from difficulties in prayer, is just to simply sit down and start to recount and count your blessings, right? To do what the hymn that we just sang calls us to do. To count our blessings, to literally name them, write them out one by one. To count our blessings and to see what God has done. To remind ourselves all that it is that God has done for us. It can be hard to pray, and it's easy in that difficulty to prayer to forget to see and remind ourselves what God has done. And so that's why God really makes prayer simple. 
What he does to us is he says, come to me, speak to me. He literally bends his ear to us. He stoops down to listen to us. And what he listens for is for us to recount our blessings before him. To listen to us, recount all the things that he has done for us, all the ways that he has blessed us, all of those spiritual blessings that esteem our identities in Christ. Brothers and sisters, God does not invite us to do this for his benefit. He does not forget who he is. He has not forgotten all the ways that he has richly blessed us. But rather, God does this. He stoops down to listen to our recounting of his blessings for, for our good, right? He knows that we need to remind it, be reminded of all that he has done for us. We need reminding of how good our God truly is. And so God, in his rich mercy and his rich love, he gives us prayer to do that. He gives us this opportunity to individually and intimately come before him through his son, Jesus Christ, and count and then recount for our hearing, for our good, the many ways that he has blessed us. He gives us an opportunity to corporately and communally, as a church, come before the Father to count and then recount our many blessings from God. Every blessing of God from the beauty of creation to the beautiful salvation of his son, Jesus Christ. Proper prayer starts with praise and proclamation of all that God is and all that God has done for us. That's not for God's benefit, but that is for our personal benefit. It's for our corporate benefit as a church. So the first question, how do I pray? Begin with centering your prayers on the right thing. Centered on growth in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And out of that growth in your love for all God's people. And then once you begin the act of prayer physically, begin it by counting and then recounting before your God his blessings to you. And see what God, through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that resides in every believer's life, see what God will do. Spoiler alert, the Holy Spirit will lead you to the place that he led Paul. The place of knowing what it is that we should pray for. And here, as we continue, proper prayer calls us. It seeks wisdom and revelation. And I want to unpack four things and four sources of revelation and wisdom that we should seek in faith and through prayer. Let's reread all of verses 17 through 23 once more, and then we will walk through the four calls for wisdom and revelation that God invites us to. Paul says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, that he may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. The power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and then seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, every name that is invoked, not only in the present age but also in the one to come. And God has placed all things under Christ's feet and appointed Christ to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Now, Paul is very clear in the second half of verse 17 what goal we seek as we seek wisdom and revelation from God. It's all summarized and all wrapped up in we seek to know God better, right? When we seek wisdom and revelation from God, we seek to know God better. That's the sole end of revelation and wisdom from God. When we seek insights or glimpses of God, we do so to know and understand so that we can follow God. God better. Yet so often, somehow in the church and in the world, wisdom and revelation from God, when sought in prayer, it, it often doesn't help us understand God better. Oftentimes it actually may blur our understanding of who God actually is. In fact, a lot of revelation that is sought in the church and relayed to us as coming from God doesn't actually help us know God better. An example of this is Julie and I several months ago now. We're at a worship gathering and in the middle of a time of prayer, the leader started to say to us that he, that he felt uh, from God, a uh, calling from God, a revelation from God that someone here or maybe multiple someones here had a, had a headache that the Lord wanted to heal. 
that, and he said that anyone who had a headache should raise their hands and they would be prayed over and that by the power of God, their headache would be healed. Now that was really confusing for me because God had the power to heal fully someone's headache, but he didn't have the power to fully reveal who it was that actually had the headache that needed to be healed, right? I mean, has anyone been in an experience like that? It just didn't make sense to me. God could, could heal the individual's headaches, but he couldn't reveal who it was that actually had the headache. Now, it just didn't square to me with, with Scripture or the prayer from God's people that we see in Scripture. And so I say, heed this as a warning, brothers and sisters, that we may not be swayed by the waves of mysticism mixed with Christian prayer. Proper prayer leads to godly wisdom and revelation. And that one purpose of godly wisdom and revelation is to help us know God better. It's to help God, us understand our Father in heaven better. That's what seeking wisdom and receiving revelation from God should do as prescribed by God's word in our lives. It helps us know God better. And our God does not deal in guesses. He does not deal in feelings. He does not deal in partial truths. He deals in power, Paul reminds us. He deals in the power that raised a man from the dead. The power that raised a man from the dead, not on a whim, but he raised Jesus Christ from the dead through the wisdom of the cross that we looked at uh, back on Palm Sunday. The wisdom of God revealed through the cross that has been in effect since the very foundations of the world. Don't be misled by the wisdom of man. The wisdom of God helps us understand God better. It helps us know God better. If any type of, of wisdom or revelation that we receive in the church from man doesn't help us understand God better, if it blurs our picture of God, if it is not in line with the prayers of the saints described in God's word, then it might not be. It probably isn't revelation from God. Proper prayer helps us know God better. Just as proper prayer, proper wisdom and revelation from God helps us know the hope of God better. What is the hope of God? We talked about it at length at the beginning of our message, and Paul points us back to the first, points us back to it in the first half of verse number 18. The wisdom and revelation that we seek from God and that comes from God helps us know his hope, the hope of Jesus Christ better. The hope that we seek to see through the eyes of our hearts that God has done the work, right? We talk about it every week. That God has given us the blessings. That God, in fact, freely has given us every spiritual blessing in Christ. Every blessing, for, which, of course, the greatest of these is the redemption and forgiveness of sins that leads to new and eternal life and comes only through Jesus Christ. That is our hope, right? That is the hope of God. And so that is the hope that we seek. The hope that we seek to see more, not just with our physical eyes, yes, but with our spiritual eyes, with the spiritual eyes of the heart, as Paul puts it here. The hope that in Jesus Christ, God has done what only God can do. Take our place in sin, pay that price, which is death, but then fulfill and render that price defeated by the defeat of death through the raising of his son, and the resurrection from the dead that happened on Easter morning. The hope of Jesus Christ is that God is alive, that he is seated at the right hand of God in victory over all the authorities of this world, even its greatest authority, which is death. That's the hope of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so in prayer, may we seek to know and more fully and more intimately live out this living hope. So we can experience that hope in our lives and proclaim that hope through our lives. So what do we pray for? Two things we've studied for. We pray to know God better. We pray to know the hope of God better. And thirdly, we pray to know the beauty of the church better. Paul says in the second half of verse number 18 that he prays that we, that Christians, that the church, that we will know the riches of his, Christ glorious inheritance in his holy people better. What in the world does Paul mean by that? Let's break it down. What is Christ's glorious inheritance in his holy people? Simply, that is you and I. It's believers. It is us as his holy people and as his church, as his bride. 
The church, as God's word defines and describes, it is, it is not an organization. It's certainly never been and never will be a building. The church is always a gathering of people. It's an assembly of God's people. It's the ecclesia in the original language. And so one of the things that Paul teaches us is that we should pray for that the world to be known by the beauty of this assembly. For the church, I should say, to be known to the world by the beauty of this assembly. That we and the world know the beauty of this assembly as it is designed to be. As the beauty of this gathering of people as it will one day deliver through Christ to be. One day within this gathering of the Lord's people, every tear will be wiped away from our eyes. There will be no more sin or sorrow. There will be no more need for the prayer request, part of our prayer list, because we will in every single way, each and every one of us who are in Christ, we will be healed. We will be healed physically, mentally, and certainly spiritually. We will all be whole and we will all be healed. That's the reality of God's people and the inheritance that they have and are in Christ. But in addition to there being no more sorrow, no more grief, no more pain, and as a result of there being no more sin, there will also be within God's people no more spite, there will be no more gossip, there will be no more slander, no more deceit, there will be no more disunity. We will be perfectly one and united with our Father, right? That is what we as God's people, as the church, will one day be delivered to be in and through Christ. That is Christ's glorious inheritance, a perfectly united church. But Paul says and Paul prays that, that we should seek that today. We should not wait for the day of Christ's return. He says to the church in Ephesus the same thing that he would say to us in Whitehorse, that we should be reflections of Christ's glorious inheritance today, that we would be free from the things that define the world and its inheritance, which we know where that leads that we should instead, instead seek to be full of the things that define Christ's inheritance. That we would, and that the world would know the beauty of the church of Jesus Christ as designed by Jesus Christ. And finally, that, that we would be, know the power of God through prayer. Here we are again. Paul brings us back to where I left you two weeks ago in our stories of his power sermon series, reflecting on the power of God. Paul actually goes to great depth in describing the power of God that we have available to us. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, that now has seated Jesus Christ at the right hand of God in victory. In verse number 21, Paul uses four different Greek words to describe how far above God has seated Jesus Christ above all other forms of power and authority in this world and in the heavenly realms. He reminds us clearly in verse number 24 that God has set everything, Everything under Christ's feet and thus under Christ's power. Everything is under Christ's power, including Christ's church, including you and I. And Paul reminds us that this means something wonderful for us. As those under Christ's power and those calling on Christ's power through prayer. It means that we are Christ's body, that we are the fullness of his body, meaning we, the church, are filled by Christ. So we are filled by the one who fills all things. We are filled by the one who is above all things. And so I want to close by reminding you that these are not empty words, that these are not vain and empty promises by God, that we do not pray in hopes and wishes, but that we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the name that is above every other name, the name that has true power over all things, dominion over every force and foe of evil. I want to remind you that there is power in that, in the name of Jesus Christ, that we place at the end of our prayers. Now, this allusion to a biblical reality that Paul makes to us here, that Christ has everything under his feet, all things under his feet, it's not without example in the world. Rulers and emperors throughout the ages, including in Paul's day and still in our day, have sought this very thing. In fact, one of the emperors of Paul's day, Emperor Trajan in Ephesus, literally put the world under his feet in stone. He did so in the form of a statue where he was literally sort of standing like this with a globe under his foot. And that was meant to be a warning sign to Ephesus and to any other nation or town who might cross him that his power was 
supreme, that all things, the world included, were under his feet. Now the problem for Emperor Sir John was that his power was not actually supreme. Because number one, he, like any other mortal, he died and he remained dead, unlike Jesus Christ. But not only that, even Trajan's power stamp in stone was unable to remain. Now, I would, I would show you a picture of this statue, but the problem is it, it doesn't remain to this day. The world is still not under Trajan's feet. In fact, this is all that remains. It's just this place where his foot, his statue once stood. His statue, his stamp of having the world under his power, it was unable to stand the test of time. It was unable to stand the test and strength of this world. It had an end like Trajan. It met its death. But brothers and sisters, I remind you that this is not and this will never be true of Jesus Christ's power. His name is the name that is above every other, not in stone, but we're reminded here, his name is seated at the right hand of God. He is placed on a living throne by a living God. We do not pray to a God of stone. We do not pray to a God of wood or a creature. We do not pray to a mere mortal. We pray to the living God, the one who has everything and every name beneath his feet for eternity. The one who's at, every, who at his feet, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, what? That he is Lord. We do not pray with wishful thinking in mind. We pray with the power of God that raised Jesus Christ from the grave in mind. And that means something. It means that proper prayer pursues purposeful knowledge of this power of God. We pray with a purpose, brothers and sisters. We pray with a power, and we pray with a pursuit in mind. Simply put, the purpose is to know God better. To know the glorious inheritance of his son better. To know his son and the love that he has for us better. We pray with a power, and that power is the same power that raised our Savior and our Lord from the very grave The ultimate form of of sin is, is death, and Jesus Christ is sovereign over that. We pray in the power of the God who has done the impossible. And so I ask you this morning, are you praying for something that is impossible by human strength? If so, and if you do so in Jesus' name, you do so in the power of the God over impossible. And we pray with a pursuit in mind. And that pursuit is growth. Growth first in faith, growth in our personal faith, growth in our personal relationship with God, growth in our intimacy with God, growth in the ways that we exemplify and bear witness to him, growth in the ways that we know and experience him, and then growth in the kingdom of God, the expansion of the kingdom of God. The purpose of one more lost soul finding this hope and power of Jesus Christ. How do we pray as Christians? We pray with a purpose, with power, and for and and for the and for our living faith and for a love of God's people to grow. We pray for knowledge and experience of the power of God. So let's pray in this way. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you for the truth of your word and the person of your son, Jesus Christ, who you've sent to us. We thank you that as those that are called to pray, we are not people that are called to, with some type of, uh, to pray with some type of deficiency or inadequacy. That we pray in the very power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. That we are given this gift of prayer and to pray in the power of God so that we can grow in our understanding and relationship with God so that we can seek wisdom and revelation from you to understand you better, so that we can follow you more perfectly in your lives. So with that in mind, we pray to this end. We pray that individually, each and every one of us here and those gathered online, that the prayer of our hearts, that that what we seek with uh, the eyes of our hearts is to see you, is to know you, and to follow you better to follow you more perfectly, to more intimately know you and fellowship with you through your Son. 
Lord, we pray by the very power of the Holy Spirit, by the power that is seated Jesus Christ at your right hand in this moment, that has every power and dominion of this world under his feet, that we would be able to live in that power as your church, that corporately as this body we would seek in faith to know you and follow you more intimately. We know the purpose you've given to us, which is to help people know and follow your son, Lord, and it is only by your power, by your grace and your rich mercy that we are able to do so. And so we seek that in Jesus' name, our living hope. Amen. Do you want to stand and worship with us? I need the piano turned on whenever... Can you turn the piano on? <laughs> 